All right, folks, I think we'll uh, we'll get started as, as, as people continue to trickle in. Uh, my name is Andrew Louds. I'm director for uh, federal policy at National Taxpayers Union. Uh, with me is my co-host, Jonathan Bidlack of uh, the R Street Institute. Many thanks to, to R Street for hosting our webinar today. This is the third uh, episode in a series that we're calling Pentagon Purse Strings, uh, which takes a, a uh, close and uh, look at the um, uh, the, the far-ranging and, and large Pentagon budget um, and uh, interviews experts uh, who, who uh, have worked both inside and outside of government. Um, Want to get right into it, introduce our, our uh, first first guest, but before we do so, uh, I'll, I'll point out that for folks who want to ask questions uh, as we're getting underway here, there is a Q&A box. Uh, on the, there should be a Q&A box on the bottom of your screen. Feel free to uh, put in written questions and we'll try to get to them throughout the hour. Um, and without further ado, uh, uh, let me introduce our special guest today. Uh, Lisa Hirschman is the former chief management officer of the Department of Defense. She is the third uh, ranking civilian, or she was the third ranking civilian officer at the Pentagon and the highest ranking woman ever confirmed by the US Senate to a Pentagon position. She is a recognized thought leader in business transformation who brings extensive private sector experience uh, to her service at the Department of Defense. Um, before her service at DOD, uh, Lisa was also founder and CEO of the DeNovo Group, a business transformation and process management consult consultancy. Lisa, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Uh, awesome. Well, let's get right into it. Um, uh, you know, uh, Jonathan and I and, and uh, uh, some of our colleagues at, at, at our organizations are quite familiar with the, the, uh, the, the chief management office. Um, but not all of the uh, our listeners here might be. So can you share with our listeners a few basics on the former chief management office position? Uh, why did Congress create the position? What was your mission? And in your time as CMO, uh, what did you accomplish? Sure. It's a good question because it's a relatively unusual title to have, say, in government. And this started, well, if you think about it, uh, the Department of Defense has been thinking about reform and transformation since 1941 when the Truman Committee was established. And the focus was how do we become good stewards of taxpayer dollars and make sure that we have an effective military force and that we are not losing focus on priorities and outcomes that help defend the nation. So there's been an ongoing need for savings and modernization. And you know, think about back in the 40s, the Department of Defense was known as the premier leading edge research and development organization. And that's changed over the years. So it was, uh, so the need for modernization and the focus on reform has been uh, for a long time. In 2005, really was the start of some conversations around what if we had someone dedicated to that role and their focus was on the management of DOD as well as how to improve the way we fundamentally do business. And so back in 2005 was the start of the creation and the putting together the statutory requirements, the responsibilities, the authorities. And it started as a deputy chief management officer at an undersecretary level. And it had fits and starts from 2008 to 2018. Um, it, it produced some momentum, but it had its challenges. I, I believe it was about 60% of the time the role wasn't filled. And it was primarily filled by really smart, great people, but from the inside. And so they didn't necessarily have the ability to draw in maybe from other experiences. And so I think that, as I said, great people, they did produce some momentum. It takes time to get your arms wrapped around, you know, the 19th largest economy in the world. And so it was, uh, I, I think one of their biggest challenges from my private sector experience was they didn't have the necessary authority. So in 2018, the Congress, and let me say this, and I can't emphasize this enough, they got it right. They made it the number three position, which even from industry, it cannot be done. And I've studied over 1300 different companies on what they do right and what they don't do right. And most of my career has been around transformation. And you have to have it at the most senior level with authorities, 
and responsibilities to go with it. So they made it the number three. They also statutorily required that the position have a minimum of seven years industry experience specific to large scale reform. And I think that was uh, significant. So, you know, our mission was, if you recall, and for maybe some of your listeners, that there, the national defense strategy has three lines of effort. The third line of effort is reforming the, uh, the Department of Defense and essentially making good use of the resources that we are given uh, through Congress. And so it was not only reform, but as uh, we, uh, the role was um, in place, even additional responsibilities were added on depending on who the Secretary of Defense was. I served for just under three years and served four different Secretaries of Defense. So the ability to pivot and the expectation shifted, but primarily it was for uh, making, looking at re reducing, modernizing and transforming. Um, I'll give you an example of uh, when Secretary Esper was at the helm, he said to me in about an 11 minute conversation, it was great. He said, Lisa, I'm used to working with a Secretary of the Army, Navy and Air Force. But for this entire organization under uh, OSD, what we call the fourth estate, everything that's not one of the services, I don't have a single person to point to. I'd like you to be the secretary of the fourth estate. So that was something that was added. Accomplishments, GAO uh, validated. We were able to deliver 37 billion in reform savings. We also, something that gets probably underreported was looking at regulatory reform. 716 regs review, 243 of them put forward for either completely eliminating them or some kind of modification. We built the first ever unified budget for that fourth estate. And uh, we found a way to completely eradicate across the board cuts and focus more on modernization and reform for improvement. And the improvement comes in all shapes and sizes. We focus a lot on the money and the savings, but we're also looking at taking, you know, in one, uh, one instance, two to four years off of a program implementation timeline, which was helping our military men and women specifically on the battlefield. So hopefully that's a good summary. Yeah, I think that was great. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you again for, for being here. Um, I think this is a really important topic, and it's a great example, as you pointed out, of of things being done right. I think, you know, oftentimes outsiders like us look at, look at government, and you can very easily point to all the things that are wrong, and it's nice to have something that you can point to that, um, you know, actually accomplish or at least uh, work toward accomplishing um, a pretty clearly defined mission. I am um, I'm, I'm fascinated by your, your private sector experience. Um, I'm curious to have you talk a little bit more about how you accomplished your mission in the context of the government um, and in the, the Pentagon. And you know what are the what are the techniques you undertook? Um, how did you identify savings and efficiencies at the Pentagon? And and you know maybe you can compare and contrast that a little bit too with your with your private sector experience. Are there things that you learned in the CMO role um, at, you know that that may have been different than your private sector experiences, or or to what degree were you able to apply your your past um, your past knowledge and skills? Well, thank you for the question, and, and I'm smiling because uh, because I've had so much experience in reform, and prior to coming to DOD, I actually worked for a Fortune 100 company, and I was responsible for reform in 72 countries. So I had the you know, privilege of understanding the importance of culture on the success and also the approach that you take to transformation. So... Um, Coming from the outside, I will say on day one, I was a little bit apprehensive because I thought I'm probably what would appear to be almost an alien walking into the building because I had never worked in government before. My husband is a retired legislator from Indiana, so I was not unfamiliar with the practices and how things run. But on day one, I quickly recognized, even uh, amongst uh, my uh, fellow appointees, I didn't know a single person in that building. And so I took the approach of drawing from my international experience and saying, 
it's, it's, all, it's coming into a new culture. It's like a different country. They have their own way of dressing, their own language that is a litany of abbreviations. But I was able to put forward things like the importance of stakeholder engagement, understanding who your customers are, understanding where your baseline of performance is, and also looking for the litany of processes that are very similar to the private sector. Procurement, supply chain, logistics, operations, research and development, engineering, acqui you know, large scale acquisition, all of these have a very similar bent to the private sector. What, what I learned very quickly is uh, trying to, to make a one-to-one -one comparison with the private sector. As I mentioned before, DOD is often seen as a small country. I mean, we have the economy about the size of Belgium. And so trying to make the assimilation between industry standards, benchmarking and the performance of DOD was a combination of art and science. So it was a benefit to have no preconceived ideas and coming in from the outside and playing the what if, but it was also a benefit to have a wonderful team, many of whom had been at DOD for a long time and could help me understand what worked and hasn't worked in the past. And that accelerated some of our progress. So, you know, we took a multi-pronged approach. Again, I uh, mentioned earlier that often people are focused on just the savings and think that all we did was cuts. Look, cuts and reform are not one in the same, but they're not mutually exclusive. And so DOD was very good at the practice of cuts, but not necessarily the transformation or modernization. So we did look at how do we consolidate, eliminate, reduce, because there's a lot of redundancies. People may have heard me say before, what they don't know about DOD is we have 355 cloud initiatives. That's a lot. Uh, what's the right number? We don't know, but it seems like an area that's worth exploring. We looked at modernization in how we manage contracts. For instance, 45,000 contracting officers and 2,500 contracting offices. There's a great opportunity there for consolidation. Also modernization with how we run a complete uh, grocery chain that we call commissaries and particularly think about coming off the heels of COVID, how our buying behaviors have dramatically changed and the need to be a nimble organization to keep up with the needs. And then finally, uh, one of the things we we're starting to explore was nobody ever looked at all the different organizations within DOD and did they have the right business model? And was it effective and efficient? The Defense Logistics Agency, for example, does um, purchasing and warehousing, they do logistics, but they also are a bit of an energy company and they run fuel farms. Is there, is it right to have it under a single model or should it be run like three profit and loss centers? Ho hopefully I answered uh, all the parts to your question. For sure, for sure. And, and, um, and, and I, I definitely have a, a follow up there, Lisa, but before we do that, I, I uh, very rudely uh, neglected to introduce our, our, our other guests um, uh, earlier in the webinar. Uh, uh, so my apologies, Mark, but a little bit later in the program, uh, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll talk to Mark Kansian, Senior Advisor with the Center for Strategic and International Studies International uh, Security Program, also an expert on these issues. And someone who uh, I, I think Lisa and uh, Mark know each other well, but um, uh, so we're looking forward to that conversation. And my apologies, Mark, for 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 not introducing you sooner. But uh, Lisa, um, uh, you, you kind of alluded to this uh, towards towards the end of, of of your prior answer. You're no longer on the inside, but obviously your insights on the Pentagon's business reform efforts are built more on expertise and experience than most. So where do you think? DOD and Defense Secretary Austin need to go from here on changing the Pentagon's business management pra uh, practices. Um, another way of phrasing this question, uh, you know, if you were still in the CMO position, uh, what would be next on your agenda? 
You know, I appreciate it. And first of all, let me say you have a, a great, uh, Mark will be a great contributor. He has been a wonderful sounding board for me. And with his knowledge, he was someone I turned to and said, hey, am I approaching this? You, you know, give me the pros and cons and where I might find roadblocks. So I am over the moon to be able to see him uh, again. And I, I even caught myself in answering when you were asking me questions. It's hard for me to get out of DOD because I keep saying we. Uh, and that's because I, I feel so attached and still very passionate about what was accomplished and really hope that the work can be continued because the trajectory that we were on and the results that we were uh, accomplishing and the way that we were training people. And, and again, this is not just about cuts. It's also not just about uh, reform and, and modernizing, but we were helping our employees and upskilling them as well. Uh, I'll give you an example, just in that category management, contract management alone, we trained over 181 personnel uh, equivalent to 1,225 um, professional learning points to increase their skill sets. So we had a sustainment uh, strategy as part of it. And, and I think, you know, and I, I applaud uh, Secretary Austin and DepSecDef Kath Hicks and um, to, to Kath kudos for knocking me out of the highest ranking uh, Senate confirmed female spot because this is one that you're happy to see somebody uh, do better than you. So congratulations to her. I think a few things. They need to understand uh, the current state. Where and that's where are the money? Where's the money and the resources being spent? And how does that compare to their strategy and the outcomes that they're expecting? Uh, avoid. I, I strongly recommend that they avoid what's comfortable, what's familiar, and make sure that. Um, that they rely on data. And we've done a lot to bring data more to the forefront. And that's a collective we, not just the CMO. We, we did hire the first chief data officer for DOD. And there are chief data officers in the services as well, had a great working relationship with all. So that is something that I can say the entire building was very excited about. So I, I would say just to make sure you don't fall into the familiar thinking, the comfortable thinking, because transformation is hard. It's easy to understand and it's very challenging to implement because whatever you're doing, you're disrupting. You're either challenging the need, you're challenging the priority, you're challenging the funding, you're challenging the head count, and you may be introducing dramatically different ways of doing business. That can be very uncomfortable. And most often than not, change is translated to the recipient as loss. And so it's one of the reasons why there has to be a, a care in the change management piece, which is why we did a lot of stakeholder engagement and coming together with the service secretaries and other leaders to how do we get to win? Here's the problem. Let's together come with a solution. So the areas that I was working on next on my agenda is I mentioned uh, typical um, or previously the way to cut was across the board cuts. And I explained it from my industry experience serving on corporate boards. And I said, look, I'm going to be blunt here. If I were on a board and, my, and the CEO came and said, I'm doing across the board cuts, I would question their understanding of the entire organization because some areas need to be invested in heavily. Other areas may need to be cut or eliminated. So across the board doesn't get you there. It's, it's a fire drill, if you will, just to meet a number. So we actually, Secretary Esper gave me a $5 billion bogey to hit in the fourth estate. I actually presented him with 6.2 billion in savings. 4.9 billion of that came from pure transformation, not a single cut. 
So it was a game changer for us. And we took the opportunity of a unified budget bill to put that in place. And I think that's, I would be over the moon to see that continue. The other things on my agenda were shifting the organization to outcome metrics. Let me give you an example. The uh, IT organization, the research and engineering organization and all the services have their own AI initiatives. AI is really important and getting it right and, and doing it quickly is also important, but you have to make sure data is in place first. So what would happen if we had an outcome metric for all of DOD that explained the expectations and the value from AI and held each of those organizations accountable to that? So shifting from the output, did I check the box? Yes, I started up an AI initiative versus what's the expectation, the timeline, and how are we going to implement that all of them collectively are held to? And then, as I mentioned earlier, Two, and this is probably two parts, continuing to modernize. Um, when I was leaving, it was very frustrating to hear that we had funded $100 million of a $1.7 billion initiative for a new IT platform in one of the agencies that had an 18-year timeline. That's not modern. And if you look at the size of that agency to the private sector, um, that 1.7 billion should have been closer to 800 million and the timeline would not be 18 years. It would be somewhere in the neighborhood of three to five. So continuing to introduce those game changing benchmarks and showing people how to do that so that they can get excited. And then I mentioned um, business model um, review and evaluating what, what's appropriate. I, give, I have to give a shout out to Space Force and uh, General Raymond's, he came to me and he said, I don't want to start it up the same way we start up organizations in DOD. I want to use lean startup concepts. And I said to him, you had me at hello. And so some of my team that remains there is continuing to work with them on that. And so I would like to see that work continued. Yeah, that's very, that's very interesting. You, uh, you teed me up a little bit, I guess, for my, my next question, but I'll, I'll add a comment real quick and just say that I, I do think that, you know, from my perspective, that a lot of the, the challenge seems to be really reducing the incentive to spend more in the future. And I like your point a lot that, you know, cuts and reform can kind of be seen as dirty words, but, you know, if done properly, the goal is to, to make it stronger. And so um, I, I appreciate how your work kind of contributes to that. Um, so my question, which is you know maybe a bit of a fun one, is about the relationship between uh, DoD and Congress, um, and you know and maybe the, the relationship between the CMO and Congress. Um, you know, I wonder to which I mean I think there's this perception that um, you know Congress interferes in in the Pentagon, and you you just mentioned you know an example of a program that is being funded even though it, there may not necessarily be a need for it to be funded, and so. You know, I wonder to which degree, from your perspective, um, and based on your experience, you think that you know these outside forces, you know, maybe Congress, maybe others, I don't know, um, you know, interfere with um, the Pentagon's budget or just you know the um, the, the, the Pentagon's operations in general. Um, you know, I think about again these legacy programs or you know bases being open in districts for reasons that you know don't necessarily relate to national security, and so. Um, yeah, I guess I'm just curious if it made your job as the CMO harder, uh, harder to do and, and how you sort of view generally the relationship between uh, the work that's happening inside DOD and, um, and Congress, which is theoretically supposed to exercise oversight over, uh, over the department. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting question in that I used to hear people in DOD both um, laud and criticize Congress, and often it was for the same things. And I remember, you know, it was probably as recently as six months ago, finally looking at someone and said, you can't have it both ways. You run to them when you have an initiative that you particularly want, and you convince them to put it into law, but then you come back to the building and complain about their overreach and getting in too much into the details. You can't have it both ways. And so Congress is and can be a tremendous partner. I think what's critical is making sure that the lines of communication remain open. So in one of your previous questions, the one of the things that hurt the 
CMO organization tremendously, we were never funded for reform. We never had a reform budget. And anyone who has tried, has uh, pursued reform in an organization knows you can't expect results in the first 18 to 36 months. And that's an easy industry benchmark. And if you think about training alone, I used to uh, in talk to my clients about uh, increasing their training budget alone by 5x. And so it speaks to the need for the investment to make sure you have the data, that you understand the processes and all of those things. So, I, I, you know, it would, I think that, yes, there are some, um, you know, things that people from the inside DOD share with Congress. It may only be one viewpoint. And I believe that Congress is acting in a way of very, very good intentions. I think the answer to this is number one, um, we've got to focus on outcomes and expectations. Personally, I'd like to see more of that integrated into uh, what Congress puts in statute. What value do they want to deliver rather than focus on how to get there why don't we think about how to describe that outcome? And I also believe that if Congress and you know, folks within DOD sat down on a very regular basis and said, look, here's what you're trying to accomplish. Here's what we're trying to accomplish. How to get to yes for both and make it uh, more collaborative would be enormously helpful. I, the entire time that I was at, uh, uh, when I was at this as the CMO, I was not asked a single time to testify. And so considering the national defense strategy line of effort three was about reform. And yet there was no forum to have that conversation. Talk to wonderful staff members quite a bit, but to not really have that formal public interaction, I think was uh, challenging. So. Uh, you know, I know that they have a, a lot of pressure. Uh, the last NDAA was, I think it was 1,480 pages long. There's a lot in there, but I think that a higher degree of collaboration, understanding each other's needs, there's a great opportunity to get to yes from both sides. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. Um, let me, I know we're getting toward the end of our time, but I do wanna ask you one, one follow-up to that, which is, um, you know, I think I think there are a lot of people who are critical of the idea of reforming from the inside. Mm -hmm. And I wonder what you say to those people, you know, whether it's, you know, critical the ability to put downward pressure on the Pentagon budget or just generally um, work to modernize the institution. And so I wonder if you could speak um, maybe in this last question, just a little bit more broadly about some of the other things that we haven't touched on, things like, you know, rethinking missions or the role of strategy more broadly and how that impacts the work that you are doing in the context of the CMO role. Mm -hmm. Oh, it, it, it's interesting. And like I said, there is a benefit to having insiders contributing to the reform because they know what's been tried. I mentioned category management before. It is a huge opportunity to uh, save a lot of money and become more efficient. You may have heard me say before as an example, in one agency alone, we had 31 contracts for orange juice and that was with two vendors. So you've got to have some of the insiders to help you find those areas of low hanging fruit and opportunities to improve. But I do think and that there is a tremendous amount of opportunity for some outside what if scenarios that said, what if you thought about this differently? And there has to be that coming together. So I think that anytime you can um, encourage the outside thinking along with the inside perspective, you're going to have a big, a big win. Uh, I, you know, so I, I do think there's room for both, but again, thinking about the expectations uh, in terms of outcomes would be a, a, a big improvement so that everybody's not caught up in the details of, of the how. I want to make sure I got every piece of your uh, question, Jonathan. 
Um, and I think I'm getting something. No, I think that I think that I mean, you know, again, I think there's the I think you're right that it's it's um it's not always an either or proposition that it really needs to have both components. And I always, you know, Andrew's probably tired of hearing me make the comparison to a nice thick juicy steak, right? You have the fat on the outside, but you also have that fat marbled in. And maybe it's not the perfect analogy because that that marbled in fat's what makes the makes the steak steak taste good in that context. But um, but I think that, you know that's kind of how I think about some of these reforms is that you have to you have to reform from the inside too, and not just uh, not just from the outside. You you absolutely do. And the problem, just as the uh, uh, IT implementation, the 18 year, we asked the team, they're really well intentioned people. And we said, who did you benchmark? And it was one of the services. And so we did a what if, what if you looked at this organization, which is in the private sector, that's the same size as yours. And, and that hadn't occurred to them. And so if we had been part of that discussion very early on, uh, we might have had a very different outcome. So I, I do think it's a combination. And as I mentioned before, people from the inside can be enormously helpful with who to go to, who's got experience. I mean, that category management initiative was actually started in the Air Force. And I went to them and said, this is great. Can I take what you're doing and go global, meaning across DOD? And they said, yes. And they were very willing partners. And that's what made it wonderful is we brought that outside thinking, introduced it to the process they created, took it DOD wide, and were the government wide leaders in delivering on the president's management agenda for category management. So I mean, it, there, it can be done and there's great opportunity for collaboration. But again, if everybody's tied to the same outcome, it makes it a lot easier. I, I I think that's I think that's a great and and um, much needed optimistic note uh, to to end on Lisa. Um, listen, thank you so much uh, for your time with us today for for the work for for the business reform and and uh, uh, business management work you did at DoD. Um, uh, it wasn't mentioned uh, in in our conversation, but and I'm not trying to put you in a box, Lisa, but but uh, my organization NTU and Jonathan's organization R Street we. We strongly advocated last year for Congress to keep the CMO position. Uh, to put it bluntly, uh, uh, I think it was a mistake uh, that that Congress eliminated the position. And hopefully, to your point, Lisa, uh, this important work uh, will nevertheless continue because uh, there, there's 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 a lot of there, there's a lot of reform efforts that are are as of yet uncompleted, and uh, and that DoD. Uh, and other federal agencies need to need to work on. So thank you so much for the work you've done and for your time today. We 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 really enjoyed talking to you. Well, I, I appreciate that and I appreciate your closing comments. I will share with you that a senior leader in Congress said to me, and this supports that. And again, I thank you all for the support of the role. You never know, they come back. But he said, look, I don't want people, everybody thinking about reform some of the time. I want a single senior leader that has the authority to be thinking about it all of the time. It's that important. So with that, I will thank you again for having me. Always enjoyable and great, challenging, insightful questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lisa. Appreciate it. Likewise, thank you. I um I want to turn and uh and introduce the, the guests for the second half of our program, um, Mark Hansian, uh, a ret retired colonel in the US Marine Corps and currently senior advisor with uh, CSIS, um, which uh, is a fantastic organization for anyone who may not be familiar with their work, um, the Center for Strategic, Strategic and International Studies. Um, Mark has been at CSIS since April 2015. Uh, he was previously in the Office of Management and Budget, where he spent more than seven years as Chief of the Force Structure and Investment Division, working on issues ranging from uh, DOD's budget strategy to war funding and procurement programs, um, as well as um, nuclear, uh, nuclear weapons development and non-proliferation non activities uh, at the Department of Energy. Um, he previously also worked on force structure and acquisition issues in the Office of the Secretary of Defense and ran research and executive programs at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. 
In the military, Colonel Campion spent over three decades in the U.S. Marine Corps, active in reserve, serving as an infantry, art artillery, and civil affairs officer, uh, and on overseas tours in Vietnam, Desert Storm, and twice in Iraq. So um, thank you so much for, for joining us today, Mark. I, I appreciate it. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll, I'll maybe the first best first question is to just have you offer your your response or your thoughts on um, on Lisa's comments in the first half of the program, and uh, um, you know what your reactions may be. Maybe areas where you might even have a disagreement. I don't know, uh, but let's, let's start there. Well, thanks for having me on the show, uh, and let me give you a, a, a different perspective. I think we end up in many of the same places, um, but there are a couple of points I want to make off the bat. You know, the first is there's no such thing as low hanging fruit, low hanging fruit. Those were all picked years ago. If you want to make real changes, uh, the leadership has to invest political capital in doing that. And that's what makes it so difficult. Uh, many times when I was in OMB, we would have politicals come in and say things like, all right, we want to identify big savings in DOD, but we want but we don't want any political opposition. So go out and find those, uh, those items. And we would say, oh, that's easy. There aren't any. Uh, and <clears throat> just to tell a little story, uh, Newt Gingrich a couple of years ago gave a speech uh, over at the War College and he decried waste in the Department of Defense. He said he wanted to turn the Pentagon uh, into a triangle. So someone asked him, well, give me an example of the kinds of things you would eliminate. And he identified the horse cavalry, which had been eliminated 70 years earlier. Uh, and the problem is, it's very hard to get specific because then people will push back hard. So you have to invest political capital. Now, if you're willing to do that, that opens some, some doors and, uh, and we can talk about some, some ideas there. But um, that's, uh, I think, the, the, key, the key point I want to make. I guess, should we ask for those, uh, for some of those specifics to, to <laughs> start with? <laughs> Certainly. <laughs> uh, let me give you a couple of uh, ideas. The first one I'm going to start with is on personnel. And if you look at the price of personnel, active duty military are extraordinarily expensive, uh, far more expensive than uh, government civilians, far more expensive in general than contractors. It depends on the contract. but um, And then, of course, more expensive than reservists who are only part-timers. So I think the department should take a a look at all of its categories of personnel and put into the military only those activities that really need to be done by someone in the military. And there are some that do. I mean, positions that deploy, positions that go into uh, combat zones and face danger, those have to be military. But then I look at a lot of the activities. I look at the Space Force. Not clear to anybody in the Space Force really needs to be in the military. Uh, and because they're so expensive, uh, you know, that drives up your costs. And if you can move uh, some of those functions, I say, into civilians or even into contractors, uh, you'll save a lot of money. Uh, I note that there are some activities I think DOD ought to get out of. Uh, and I'll, I'll give one that's very hard, and that is DOD schools. Uh, DOD runs schools overseas, and it, and it should, you know, for bases overseas, you know, uh, uh, dependents need to get uh, an American education. But you know, they, they run about 58 schools in the United States. Now, the reason they do that is most of them were established in the 50s and 60s. Uh, DOD did that because it refused to send its children to segregated schools, uh, particularly in the South. That was absolutely the right thing to do at the time. That was 70 years ago. Uh, and now there are good schools right outside the gate. Uh, you look at Quantico, right down the, down the, the, road, the highway here, there's an elementary school a military and elementary school in, on the base of Quantico. You know, there's Prince William school system right outside the front gate. You know, it's pretty good. And, uh, but the problem is these aren't bad schools. You know, I, I, it'd be easy to get up there and say, these are lousy schools. We ought to close them all down. They are, they're good schools. They have PTAs that are very active. And if you try to uh, shut them down, uh, you'll get a lot, 58 nasty letters from parents and teachers, you know, who point out quite rightfully that they have a very good school. Now, my recommendation would be stop building new schools. In other words, don't shoot, shut down all 58, just don't build any more, you know, and as the schools wear out, you, you then just, uh, you, know, you know, move children uh, into the local school system. Now, the other place I would look are uh, entitlements. Uh, uh, 
people think about entitlement as something outside of the Department of Defense, uh, but the Department of Defense has lots of entitlements. And I'll, I'll give you one story they often um, uh, uh, do when I'm talking to audiences about budgets. I ask people, how many of you have heard of the uh, Joint Strike Fighter, uh, largest acquisition program in DoD history? And, and you know, almost everybody puts their hand up. Yes, they've, they've heard of uh, the Joint Strike Fighter. Okay, and I say, how many of you have heard of TRICARE for Life? Not TRICARE, TRICARE for Life. And the two retirees in the back, you know, they put their hand up. <laughs> uh, and I say, you know, those two programs cost about the same every year. But one of them, everybody's heard about and has an opinion about. The other one, no one's ever heard about because it's an entitlement and it's just sort of in, uh, you know, in the mix and just, you know, is accepted as, uh, um, you know, our obligation to our service members. Uh, but those entitlements, you know, should we should take a, a close look at them? Uh, now, I would say I'm a beneficiary of TRICARE for Life, <laughs> uh, but I recognize, you know, that it's an extremely uh, generous benefit, uh, particularly for you know, retirees who are already pretty well uh, compensated. Again, it was a very hard, you get a lot of pushback from the retiree community, uh, but there's a, there's a lot of money there. Uh, you raised the question about Congress and its uh, activities. <clears throat> and, and it is true, they, they often uh, will keep programs going. Um, they'll uh, keep bases open. Um, and sometimes those get mixed into some strategic questions too. So I'm not gonna totally pick on, on the Congress, but if we look at bases, you know, Congress has refused to uh, uh, authorize another base closure uh, commission. But the problem with base closures is it's not, the, it's not that there are unneeded bases. There were unneeded bases. Those were all wiped out in the first round of BRAC. What you have now are bases that are maybe a little underused. What you have is you have five bases that are operating at 80%. And what you wanna do is have four that operate at 100% and get rid of one. But that means you know, shutting down a base that's working at 80%. Uh, and, that's, and that's hard. Uh, now BRAC has also been very helpful for the services in reorganizing. In other words, it's not just that you shut down a base but you change the way you do things because now uh, you can move activities around, you can change organizations and someone else is paying for it. Uh, and when you look at the history of, of BRAC services have used that as a transformational uh, activity. But sticking on BRAC for one second, if you look back at the original BRAC round, you, know, you would say, well, how did um, the executive branch, I think it was Dick Cheney at the time, uh, how, did he, how did he do it? Well, he did two things. First is he put political capital into it. He called members of Congress and asked them to vote for this. The president called members of Congress and threatened them uh, to get them to vote for this. And then Cheney started a separate process to close down bases on his own authority. And there is a separate process. It's a very cumbersome process, but he, he initiated that. So the members of Congress got the message. All right, either we set up an independent commission that decides which bases get closed, or Dick Cheney will decide for us, and they decide to go for the independent commission. But he invested the political capital. The contrast I would make is to the Obama administration, which, to its credit, proposed BRAC, I think, four times, but they never made a phone call. You know, they never put any political capital into it. They were quite happy to get the good op-ed out of the New York Times and then just stop there. And of course, none of them went, ever went anywhere. So again, it's possible you got to put the political capital in there. Uh, let me That's make a, one more. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, you go, go ahead. ahead. No, go ahead, Mark. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, no, I was just going to say this. This is an incredibly interesting response. So, so if you had an additional point, please, um, uh, please do follow up because um, I think we'd like to hear it. Sure. Let me make one more point, and then I'll I'll you know, open for your questions here. <clears throat> and the last one is, Congress is addicted to overhead. Now they like to say, oh, we wanna get rid of overhead. We wanna cut overhead. But every time there's a problem that comes up, they create a new organization, a new headquarters to try to solve that problem. Uh, when I first went into the Pentagon and I'm not gonna say when that was, uh, there were two undersecretaries. Uh, now there are seven, I think with the CMO, which was equivalent to an undersecretary, actually senior undersecretary, uh, they're down to six, I think, but still, you've had this great increase because, and, and it's always justified as we're gonna streamline the Pentagon by adding a new layer. Uh, sometimes I hear, 
suggestions that there be a second deputy secretary of defense. I think that's, that would, it's a horrible idea. Uh, and I can talk more about that. Um, combatant commands, you know, they've added combatant commands, you know, somebody is concerned about Africa, you know, we ought to be paying more attention to Africa, we can create an AFRICOM, which not only is a headquarters, but now, of course, there's a lot of stuff they want to do in Africa. Uh, we have Space Command, uh, we have now Spyber Command, and, uh, and we have Space Force, you know, we're going to do more in space, we're going to create a whole new service now uh, for space. And each one of those you can make an argument for, but the fact is, you know, you're creating more and more overhead. At the same time, you're complaining about the, the, the size of the overhead. Okay, I'll get off that box there <laughs> and uh, let you ask no, questions. No, no worries, Mark. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, before I ask my question, um, uh, just, just wanted to share, uh, Lisa, you'll, you'll obviously have more interesting questions and insights potentially than Jonathan or I would. So if you wanna jump in at any point, questions, comments, please do. <laughs> um, Oh, I, I appreciate that. And I have to give uh, kudos to uh, Mark Cancy. And I, I, number one, and, and I understand his comment about low hanging fruit. Coming from industry, when you see 31 contracts with two vendors, that to me is what I would refer to. But his point about political capital and intestinal fortitude, I think that goes with that. He's spot on. And Mark, I have to I was smiling ear to ear when you talked about benefit versus entitlement because it was on TRICARE and I was sitting next to Secretary Esper and I leaned over and I said, do you see health benefits as an entitlement or a benefit? He said, what's the difference? I said about $1,000 a month. And so it was that uh, very same discussion. So kudos, Mark, for making that point. I appreciate it. Uh, well, and then to, to come back to Lisa, I, I think that was one of the problems that her office faced you know that is there were a lot of people out there who thought there were large savings to be had easily and then when she puts these savings on the table now the orange juice is easy you know consolidate yeah. those yeah. but many of the savings she proposed were in the medical area and congress hates that uh and they, they said no 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 we don't want the hard ones we want the easy ones and uh and that put i think the the whole office in a very difficult position no, thank you for saying that. So, um, Mark, I, I do want to, uh, I really want to hone in on this, um, on this idea of political capital and sort of uh, turn to uh, your assessment of, um, of the new administration uh, to catch up our listeners, although I'm sure many of them know uh, some of the reporting we've seen from various media outlets not yet confirmed. Uh, indicates that we're looking at likely a flat fiscal year 2022 defense budget from the Biden administration, um, uh, slight slight decrease if, if you account for inflation. And, and it seems like the Biden administration may be attempting to sort of politically straddle uh, the progressive wing of his party, which is calling for significant uh, cuts often across the board, to, to your point earlier, Lisa, that, that across the board cuts are, are uh, uh, to put it lightly, not the most efficient way to do things. Um, uh, and then on the other side, you have uh, a number of Republicans uh, calling for three to five percent increases per year in the DOD budget in order to meet the, the national defense strategy. Um, uh, do you foresee the Biden administration spending any political, well, it seems like with, with some of their constituencies, they're already gonna need to spend political capital just keeping the defense budget flat. But looking at the Biden administration and their early priorities, I guess, as it pertains to the defense budget uh, and how the Biden administration wants to prioritize um, uh, uh, defense spending and, and its, its, its own defense strategy for the next four years, how do you see how do you foresee them spending political capital that's a very broad question but I, i'd be curious to hear if you have insights there yeah uh, i can say two things i think with some confidence the first thing i can say with absolute confidence is that management reform will be part of their strategy uh, when the national defense strategy comes out just as it was with the trump administration uh, management reform will be there and highlighted i think it is extremely unlikely that they will invest political capital uh, and the reason is that they have a lot of other initiatives that they have going on. I mean, first is the, the question about the budget overall. They want to eliminate legacy programs, whatever legacy programs are. Um, they have a lot of uh, personnel initiatives, you know, they, you know um, diversity and equity. Uh, 
Um, and that's really where they want to put their political capital, uh, not in DOD schools, not in BRAC, uh, not in reforming entitlements. Uh, so I think you'll see, um, you know, you'll see, you'll see uh, a nod towards that. I don't think you'll see the political capital. But let me, let me get another question that you, you sort of raised, which is the question about the budget and strategy. Uh, because one emphasis I do want to make is, uh, you know, if you if you want the kind of strategy that they seem to be headed towards, you know, and that is a very forward uh, leaning strategy engaged with partners and allies, um, engaged in Europe, uh, maintaining some presence in the Middle East, we'll see what that looks like, moving, uh, rebalancing to the Pacific and confronting China. Um, uh, as well as doing some modernization of you know, the triad, although maybe with some uh, cuts there, uh, um, uh, supporting the all-volunteer force. If you want to do all of that, that costs a lot of money. <laughs> and yeah, you can diddle a little on the on the on the edges, but you know you can't get the big savings that progressives have called for. Uh, if you want to get those savings, you got to start doing something different. Now it is possible to do some, something different. You could say to the Europeans, "Hey, you're all rich. You've got large military forces." If you need us, we'll you know give us a call. Um, you know we'll keep the air bases open, but you know we're going home. Um, you know Trump did that, and of course you know the foreign policy community freaked out. Uh, not part of it was the way Trump did it, but um, uh, you could do that. But of course you know that's a huge change in U.S. foreign policy. So you can't have savings. You got to make the strategy uh, changes to go with it. Let me. Um, I kind of want to ask a question that's a follow up to a number of these points, which is. Um, sometimes I feel like there needs to be a flashpoint to cause people to want to expend political capital, right? So the last time we really saw a significant change in the Pentagon's budget was in the wake of the Cold War. Um, yep. And, you know, and so we had a number of forces that came together at that point in time. Um, and we saw, um, I don't know, a willingness to reduce our spending on military, military and defense related items um, and many things that were not military and defense related. So I wonder to what degree, and, it, it's, and it's interesting counterfactual, I think, in the sense that um, I've often wondered that if the Cold War ended today, whether or not we would actually follow through on reducing the Pentagon's budget despite the elimination of that, of that threat at that point in time, or whether or not things are different uh, in such a way that people would just continue to encourage spending on things even if it wasn't necessary. Um, and so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about whether or not um, there needs to be some sort of flashpoint or what that flashpoint might look like. Um, or to what degree do you think that, I mean, there may not be low hanging fruit, but to what degree do you think that that absent some sort of significant, you know, external, um, um, you know, impact or event, uh, we could still see the kinds of reforms that I think all of us are, you know, would be encouraged or want want to see. I think the end of the Cold War was a uh, unique. I mean, I mean that, you know, literally. I think it was unique, so that you did have a feeling that you that the department needed to do things different. I mean, back in those days, I was in the Pentagon, and there was a sense, you know didn't know what the floor was, you know, would, was the floor the 1948 uh, defense budget, you know, would it be go down to something, you know, predating the, the Cold War. Um, you didn't see that in the um, sort of early, uh, you know, 2000 teens, you know, 2010 to 2015, when the budget was also coming down pretty substantially after the end of the wars in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. I think the alternative is to, is to build um, incentives into the system. And BRAC is, is, a, is a good example because on the BRAC, the services got extra money to do the base reorganization. And then, and then there were savings. And, and each time there were real savings, but they didn't have to pay the money up front. Another example is uh, what the department did, for example, with uh, uh, the Army and Crusader in Comanche. Crusader was an uh, artillery piece that was really designed for the Cold War. And, uh, Comanche was a helicopter that was just having a lot of trouble. Uh, and rather than canceling the program and taking the money away from the army, you know, which would have engendered a great deal of resistance, uh, the secretary went to the army and said, okay, here, here's the deal. We want you to cancel this program 
we'll let you keep the money, but you've got to put it into places in your budget that you know, we think need reinforcement and make you more relevant uh, for the future. So in both programs, they did. You know, they, they canceled the program, put it into what it was Rumsfeld in those days, you know, felt were transformational activities. And I think those have mostly held up. And the Army went along with it. In fact, was quite enthusiastic about it. Uh, so I think if, if you build those kinds of incentives in, you know, that doesn't maybe reduce the defense top line, but it doesn't prove its management. Can you talk a little bit more about that? The, the history, you, you mentioned Secretary Rumsfeld. Obviously, there were efforts underway to, to modernize the, uh, the Pentagon. I wonder if you might give up for our, our listeners just a little bit of background on, on what that looked like and, and you know, compare and contrast it to some of the efforts we've seen more recently. Yep. Um, well, I'll, I'll take Crusader as an example because I was uh, deeply involved in that. Um, uh, Crusader was a long range, rapid firing artillery piece. And well designed for the kind of you know armor on armor engagements that you would have seen in the Cold War. It was not entirely irrelevant to the post Cold War period, but it was much less relevant. And Rumsfeld wanted to make the Army particularly you know more agile, more deployable, and a you know 70 ton uh, vehicle didn't fit that. Um, so the deal he made with the Army and you know, actually my office um, put the deal together uh, was to cancel this artillery piece. But to have the Army put the money into different kinds of fire, fire programs, so some lightweight howitzers, some precision guided munis munitions, some long range missiles, uh, and, a ver and some sensors and a bunch of other things that went with the firepower. Things that Rumsfeld fit, felt you know, were more forward looking uh, and that the Army you know, was, had requirements for I and mean, didn't disagree with. Uh, and that was uh, very successful. And I think that uh, today, if uh, the secretary wanted to make those kinds of changes uh, in the services, you know, he'd be well uh, advised to do something like that. And, and I'll give you one example, you know, the Marine Corps. Uh, the commandant is restructuring the Marine Corps. Uh, I've disagreed with some of that, but one of the things he's proposing to do is, is to cut the number of F-35s and buy uh, unmanned aircraft. Uh, I think that's a great idea, but it'll only work if the Marine Corps gets to save the, keep the money and put it into the unmanned aircraft. If you just cut F-35s and walk away with the money, then of course the Marine Corps is going to try to hold on to it. It's going to go to the Congress, talk about, you know, how you're attacking the Marine Corps. Um, but if you make it a, a deal for the Marine Corps, and then the Marine Corps will be much better uh, placed for future conflicts where, uh, you know, very, very expensive um, short ranged uh, tactical area uh, may not be um, well suited, but you know, longer range, long duration unmanned aircraft uh, will have a greater, uh, greater role. Uh, Mark, uh, we're, 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 we're coming up on the close of the hour. Um, so, so I just uh, uh, want to close things out by, by thanking you, thanking Lisa. This is, um, you know, uh, all of these, these, uh, uh, all of the conversations we've had in this series are 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 uh, have have been incredibly interesting, but it is um, it is rare to get folks like you who have such deep expertise and experience both in the private sector and in, and and in government uh, in uh, one virtual virtual room at one time. We obviously wish it were in person, and hopefully someday in the future we'll get to do so. But in the meantime, thank you both so much for taking the time uh, uh, to to speak with us today. Well, thanks for having me on the show. Yes, for sure. and I, thank you. I will. I will echo those comments and say, Mark, I'm so impressed by your by your background. You've uh, you've got me beat. <laughs> <laughs> I've been working on it for well, longer you... <laughs> than you have. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you, Mark and Lisa, you both have us both beat, but that is uh, that is part of the point of of uh, ha having you all uh, uh, share your expertise with our listeners. So. Uh, thank you both so much. Uh, for those of you listening, we will uh, we have recorded this and we will uh, our, uh, we will uh, upload it on our streets YouTube page in the coming days. Uh, be on the lookout for uh, announcement about our April webinar, which we uh, are currently planning uh, to make about the uh, about the war in Afghanistan, which obviously is a, a extremely timely ta uh, uh, subject. Um, so thank you both or uh, thank you both for your time today. Thank you everyone for tuning in and hope you have a great rest of your week. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.